The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Now, you might, you might enjoy this little 
piece of documentation. Now, this actually comes from the QED, um, QED documentation. This actually comes from the QED documentation um, written uh, back in the, I'm going to say, 60s or 70s uh, by Dennis Ritchie and other famous name you might know. And so here he is, here's this super smart Dennis Ritchie explaining regular expressions, and I thought, I can't do any better than that. So I'm just going to grab what he wrote, and I'm going to throw it up here for you, and we're going to walk through this. Uh, out a dozen of these. So here are the first ones. So an ordinary character or regular expression is a regular expression that matches that character. So if your regular expression consists of A, A will match A in a string. B will match B, A, B will match A, B. Carrot, this kind of little hat, I call it a carrot, is a regular expression which matches the null character at the beginning of the line. So we often want to match strings starting at the beginning. And a line is basically two strings separated by a new line character or character line. So caret matches this null character at the beginning of a line. Dollar is the opposite. It matches the end of a line. Dot is a regular expression that matches any single character. So right here we've got the fundamentals. Regular characters match themselves. Caret matches the beginning. Question? Or 
or law. And then we have parentheses. Now, finally, we're starting to get with this last bit, parentheses, we can match pretty much anything here. Parentheses let us make sub expressions. So the example here is A, and then parenthetically, B or C, followed by B. So this is saying we need to match an A on the one side, and the B on the other, we have B or C on the middle. Okay. So I think there aren't any more. Now we're getting into some examples. Now these are again examples Dennis Ritchie did back in the 60s or something. Uh, but they're still true today. This will still work in, in said, in Perl, in Walk, in the I, Emacs, uh, Grep, Edrep, all the Greps. Uh, you, you name it. This all still works. So ABCD will of course match ABCD anywhere in the line. A, B, or C, B match either. A, B, or C, B anywhere in the line. A, B, star, B. And here give some examples. We'll match A, C, or A, B, C, or A, B, B, C, and so on. Carrot, begin. We'll match begin at the end of the line. End, dollar, matches end at the end of the line. Now here, a little bit more complex. Carrot, begin dot star in the dollar. So that dot star, you're going to see that a lot in regular phrase. Any character, that's the dot. Star, zero or more characters. So anything that says match anything or nothing. This matches a line that starts with begin, has anything or nothing in between, and ends with end. The line could just be begin in. It could be begin quick round box jumped over and leave it off stack. In, both of those match because this dot star will match anything or nothing. <clears throat> Questions, are we good? Keep going. Okay, carrot, dollar, together matches an empty line. So there's nothing in between that carrot beginning indicator and that dollar in indicator. Empty line. Blank line. Now, We've got ABC followed by a character class of digits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. And of course, it matches ABC followed by a single digit. And then the final example here, ABC, a negated character class. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. This matches ABC followed by a non digit. Okay. We're moving at a good clip here. Does anybody want to ask a question? Then keep going. So this works the number is one and with one dash zero, right? Okay, so zero is considered always to be the end, it's not the end. No, no, and you would write uh, zero to nine. Right, zero to nine. That's what you would write. Um, and in other other um, other flavors of regular expression, we might get into that a little later. There are flavors. And some flavors are improvements over the earlier expressions. So curl, uh, which is one of the one of the big innovators in regular expressions over the years, Larry Wall and friends, they curl, and they introduced improvements. So they would put backslash D in character class to represent those digits as zero. And they would use, well, I, let me not side here, I'll, I'll keep going, we'll, we'll touch on it later. Okay, where are they used? Rep, Ed, Sed, all curl, Text editors, Ed, E, X, D, I, Emacs, Notepad++, plus plus, text me. I don't use either of those, but I, I, I check. <laughs> they use right here. Programming languages, yes, indeed. C, C++, plus plus, Off, Perl, Python, Ruby, PHP, JavaScript, Java, really nearly all of them. You've got something that's been around this long. Since even before the C language was invented, it finds its way into every program. Others, SQL, you can use regular expressions in SQL. I bet if you ask the uh, MySQL or Maria guys out here, let me put this, I need OES, right next is for IEDs, you can use it for syntax highlighting, Lex, which is a way to, well, never mind, let's, let's go on. Why? This is the Unix philosophy. Write programs to do one thing and do it well. Write programs to work together write programs to handle text streams because that's a universal interface. This is 
is a quote from Doug McElroy. He is the inventor of the next pipe So, very smart guy, very important idea, one that I use every day constantly, and I'm sure a lot of you do or will use pipes every day constantly. And what he's outlining here is a big reason why regular expressions are so important today. Because, at least in the Unix and Linux world, text is still a universal interface. We find text everywhere. You can parse it from anywhere, from the output of any program to tell you any bit of system information. You get text. And you can manipulate that with these regular expressions. And then you can do useful things. OK, an example. You guys know this program, this game, draw something? Anybody play this? Everybody knows last year. OK, we've got some head knock. We've all sort of seen draw something. Well, this was my wife. She sent me this one, right? It's a singer on a stage surrounded by people, and these are the letters. And I, for the life of me, could not figure it out. The letters E N A D U E I C. And I, I was just drawing a complete blank. I know, obviously, everybody's going, oh, come on. <laughs> well, that day, yes, I was drawing a complete blank. So what do I do? What do I, you know, Linux junkie, regular expression junkie, new expression? Absolutely! I bust out a regular expression to search for words on it. So, you know, every, every copy of Unix and Linux has a list of words. <laughs> it's not exhaustive, but it's pretty darn big. And here I'm using grep. Grep is the famous tool to use a regular expression against some text. And here's my character class, composed of E, N, A, D, U, I, and C. From, from the game. This is a repeat count saying I want eight matches. I use a carrot to say the beginning of the line and a dollar to say the end of the line. So I want a line that starts with and ends with, or excuse me, that contains eight of these letters. And I got three answers. And of course, the top one, audience, you know, baseball, obviously that's what the answer was, audience. So yes, you can use regular questions to cheat in your games. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I don't know. All right. OK, now, you know, last time I got some boobies about this. I like, I like my iPhone. I like it more because I broke it, you know, I jailbroke it. But, you know, I like, I like it that, I like it that, I like it that Linux, Mac, all these things, the previous D, let's not forget that, were all bringing Unix to the everyday world. Because when I started in this business, the only way you could get your hands on Unix was if you worked for a company that paid a bunch of money to sign to license their operating system. You'd run it on a motor roll or something. Oh, yeah, I got some head now. <laughs> there was a time when you could not get your hands on Unix yourself. These days you can. And not only can you, you can get it in something like this. And you can log in to something like this. So this is this is me logged into my iPhone. It might be my older iPhone, not this one. I don't remember. It was a year ago. But that's a process that's in my iPhone. And here, here is me editing com.apple.dynamicpager.us. And what am I editing it with? I'm editing it with Ed. Ed is a program, an editor, that I showed you in that list before, that dates way back. I mean, way back. So, you know, it's a 20-year-old program. And here it is running on an iPhone and letting me edit it to this file using a regular expression. And what did I do with this regular expression? I found the line I wanted using the regular expression bone. Just the little literal characters are you in the pool. That was run it low, this what that was. I went to the next line, the plus one, and, and then I used a replacement. I replaced the regular expression false with literal string true. So I said run it low, set that to true. Printed it just to make sure I changed it the way I wanted it to. And I wrote it out. 614 characters. So this is, this, these are, this is regular expressions 
on an iPhone to do something useful, to change one of the ELS files, to change the way that the iPhone works. Let's go on. Find Python to be great. Okay, find is you can't well, you can't work with Unix on the command line without eventually needing to use find. Find is how you list out the files on press. And find, find gives you a lot of output. It looks a little bit like LS, but there's extra stuff in there. The inodes are in there, the block counts are in there. More than just what LS gives you. But still, it's text. And text is a universal part of this. We can manipulate it with great expressions. So what was I trying to do here? I don't really remember. But I mean, <laughs> apparently what I was matching was the date. I wanted to see, so I probably made this slide in June. And I probably wanted to see all of the files that were from June. So yeah, I'll buy that. We'll go with that. That's what I meant this one. Let's move on. What is this? Counting with the well, of course, sometimes you want to know how many. How many times did something happen? Okay, here I am. So you can see the 2012 dates. Here I am, I have a I have a budget program that I put in all my stuff in. I'm I'm like that. I do that. Um, and here I am. Having, uh, looking at a CSV export from this budget program, and I want to see how many times did I buy coffee uh, in this file. So we can, of course, eGrep. So again, grep. Uh, did I talk about grep? Grep is a fan line tool which lets you use general regular expression against any text file or any pipe in uh, And that's all it's for. The name grep actually comes from the end program. Ed has a command. Ed is the editor we looked at a little bit ago. Ed has um, a command which is G, followed by regular expression, followed by P. G says globally runs regular expression. P says print the output. So if somebody said, wow, that's something I do a lot with rep, I want to be able to do it from the command line. And they wrote the command line tool and called it rep. The G, regular expression, P for print. So that's rep. EGREP is just a variant of GREP. It gives you a little bit more flavorful regular expressions. So I looked for coffee. Just coffee all by itself. That's a regular expression. Those characters can have an occurrence of coffee. Starting with the carrots, I would say at the beginning of the line. And this is what I got. And then I used the C switch to catch. So I used a different regular expression here. <laughs> So here, I'm, these are some more, more involved regular expressions. I'm saying, show me the dates where the date starts with the character class 1 through 5, followed by character class 0 through 9 plus. Plus is like star. Star says 0 or more matches. Plus says 1 or more. So I use plus a lot because often I want at least one match. And then followed by 12, because this was 2012. So how many times in the first five months of the year did I drink coffee? Well, 20 times. Buy coffee. Uh, and then, you know, if I wanted to say slightly more involved rate of expression, which is for the last, yes, <coughs> this is for the last six months. So six through nine, that's the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth month. But for 10, 10, 11, and 12, I have one followed by Zero through two. And here's another four ball. And this is in a subgroup with the parentheses. So you can start to see how this is getting a little more involved. But you can also see that regular expressions let you say very involved things. Let you match some anything really that you might want to match. Except at the end of the presentation, I'll talk about a couple of things that you don't want to match. Does anybody know when this ends? Is this oh, end? Five. Five? So we are doing fine. Does anybody want to ask a question right now? What's the question? Well, we're talking about the pluses. It's very important to know for me that, that when you say zero or more occurrence, you've got eight star. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be a general advantage of your mind. So that's the key to be worth it. So I understand that for So it really comes down to what is the first Usually you're going to say something like, ooh, A star bar. 
devices on them. So your disks under Linux have major and minor device numbers. 8 and 17 have to be the ones here. Size and offset, no name. Okay, so we'll go on. LSO is very useful. You don't use it in other Yeah. On that previous screen where you were doing one of those students at DE, you can do that and just bring the space between them? On the previous screen where I was doing multiple sets of two, let's go back. Is that D different than the students that you're doing right there? With the set command? Yeah. It is a D. Is it all you need to put a space between them? No, there's a semicolon. Oh, okay. Yeah. So set is a major programming language in and of itself. And you can have as many as you want. And set actually even has things like branching. You can say, if I match something, branch to this point in my set script and do these other things. So it, you can make actually quite complex set scripts. And it's kind of fun. You know, you know in the way that, that puzzles are fun? Sure, you could break out a you know, curl and do something nice and long and long-winded to edit something. Or you could break out set and do it with you know, 12 characters. <laughs> You're like, who did that? <laughs> Didn't make your successor. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about you? Know. <laughs> you you're never going to make that happen. <laughs> it's impossible. I've been that guy. They're impossible to believe. Ah. So, oh, right. So then let's go back. Let's go on. Now, what did I want to do with that lesson? Well, first off, I wanted to see all the files, all the real files that were opened by my user. So the real files, like I said, um, they have a number. That's the file handle number followed by a W <coughs> or a U or an R. Um, so egrep here, let's I put in a space followed by DG followed by one or more spaces. So you can see we have a space plus here, one or more spaces. Uh, because you see this can be one or more spaces. <coughs> here there are fewer spaces. Followed by a digit. So 0 through 9, that's a character class. 0 through 9, that matches a digit, a single digit. And that's an easy way to see which files I have open across all my devices. <coughs> and then you can do more things with that LSO. So here, same idea, open files. And this time, I want to see all of the processes that have files open. Um, under var log. And I want to see what process has the file open and what file it has open. So easy enough to do with LSLF. Again, text, universal interface, just a regular expression at the end here. So I start with backslash B. We have talked about this one before. Now this is one of those nice new additions that came from the Perl world. Backslash B is a word separator. Remember earlier, you hmm? Boundary. Boundary. <laughs> yeah, I suppose mnemonically boundary. But uh, I, I like to say <laughs> So boundary for ease of recollection. Word boundary. We'll go with it. Um, earlier when I said caret matches that sort of logical space between the new line and the next character. Well, boundary matches a sort of logical place between a word character and something that is not a word character. And a word character is defined as letters or numbers or underscore. Maybe dash. <laughs> um, and then a non-word character would be anything that is not in that class. So that would be white space and what? Anything else. So boundary is very useful. So I'm looking for a boundary followed by a single followed by one or more digits, followed by W, and then dot star. So any, any, any number of additional characters. And finally, slash bar, slash bar. And you can see what that matched, this part of red here. So my word boundary is here, and here's my digit, and here's my W, um, and here's the dot star. Here is the bar wall. So that's what I match. And then I'm going to use a little bit of set because all I really want is that first bit, the name of the program, and this last bit, which is the name of the file. So the set replacement I did, really simple one, space, and then any number of not 
slash. Replace that with just a space. So you see, this space matches here. Starts here. And then any number of characters that are not slash takes me all the way over to this first slash that we were involved here. And when I do that instead, and replace that string with a space, this is what I get out. And that's what I wanted in the first place. I wanted to name the program, and I wanted to see what file I had. Easy to do with regular expression, and LSOF. All right, let's see what else I've got. LSOF off. So, do we like these examples, or do we want to skip to the end? Sorry, I don't like it. Okay, good. Well, then we'll, I, I think I only got a few more. We'll, we'll keep going. So here, what's that one this time? Oh, 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 this is the same thing. You remember when, so we were talking about golf. Um, Say is like, like golfing, programming, is the term. In golf, you try and use as few swings as possible. When you write said scripts, you try to use as few letters as possible. But if you don't like SIM, a lot of people don't. There are lots of, there are many other tools that do the same thing, just a little bit more verbosely. And some people would say a little bit more understandably. So this is the same thing as the last screen, but done with off. So this time I'm asking off to print this same message. And I'm using dollar four, so the fourth column, and I'm saying it needs to match W dollar. So this time it's a little bit different paradigm because awk has already broken up the line into fields. So now we're talking about using a regular expression against the contents of a field instead of against the whole line. So dollar four is this fourth field, one, two, three, four. We don't see an example here, but if you remember before, it was a number followed by a W in the cases I was interested in. And then I'd say and, so double ampersands in all part of it, and. The ninth field needs to match the regular expression beginning with slash bar. So this is the ninth field. And caret, beginning of line, or in this case, beginning of field, slash bar. And then off lets me print this in a slightly nicer way. So this is a nice printout statement, which says I want the first part of it uh, with fit, uh, a column of 15 in a space of Y, and then the rest of it. So that's the same thing as before with the off this time. And again, regular expressions. Lots of tools implementing regular expressions. Oh, that's it. That's all the examples. So let's talk about just some concepts. Like, when do you not want to use regular expressions? And you might be sitting back going, wow, oh, these are so great. Maybe you are. I think they are. Wow, these are so great. Why doesn't Google use them? Well, of course, Google uses them all over the place, inside, under the hood, in their programs, in their scripts. Um, there's even a Google engineer who's written one of the best regular expression implementations of all time. And he's the guy who turned me on to the link, the IBM 7904 signal stuff. So not only does he know about it, he read it and understood it. So yeah, you know, kudos to him. So Google uses regular expressions, but they don't expose regular expressions to the world. They don't let you go to google.com and type in regular expressions. And there's at least one reason for that. There's probably a lot of reasons for that. But a big one is performance. It's very easy to make a regular expression, which is arbitrarily complex, long, and slow. If you put dot star, and then some string. And you ask Google to go search terabytes of data for dot star and email. I mean, can you picture it? <laughs> it would just, it would be Google's worst nightmare. That would be a match that would never return. Because it would just keep searching and searching and searching. There's also a concept in regular expressions of backtracking. Backtracking is essential to how regular expressions work. If I say foo, dot star bar. The dot star in the middle is what's called reading. So if I have a line, foo, foo bar, foo bar, foo bar, foo bar, foo bar, bar. My foo dot star bar is going to match the whole thing. Because the dot star in the middle was reading. It said, <coughs> yeah, I can keep going. I can keep going. I can keep going. Ah, there's the end. Now we've got everything. 
because it's greedy, it's going to try and go all the way to the end, but it doesn't match at the end. It has to back up. Because it's possible that part of the string earlier was matched the regular string. So greedy means you have to have backtracking. Backtracking consumes a lot of silence. It reduces the performance. Now, what do we mean when we talk about performance? Are you going to sit 10 minutes waiting for a regular expression to run? No. So, a lot of programs which are very performance sensitive, one that I have worked on for many years now is Snort. So, I, I, um, I'm a performance engineer now, but I spent the last several years being a programmer network security appliance. And this network security appliance goes in line with customers' networks. And it processes packets and does deep packet inspection on packets coming across the wire. And believe it or not, we use regular expressions to look at the contents of those packets in many cases. Now, they're not fast enough for us to use them exclusively. But they are fast enough for us to use them to make the final call. Say, wow, this would look suspicious. Let's use a regular expression to really munch down there and see what we got. And see if this is bad. See if we need to throw that back on the floor or let it pass the customer's network. So regular expressions can do this. And they can do this with decent performance, but you must be aware that performance is going to be there. So if you're on the command line, chances are you're never going to have a performance problem with a regular expression. <coughs> If you're writing stuff to process, you know, gigabit networks, you need to be thinking about performance when it comes to your expression. So there's a range of uh, I recently did some timing for your expression. Um, very large benchmarks of a large number of regular expressions across a large amount of integral. And just to give you an idea, the appropriate granularity of these regular expressions is nanoseconds. So these regular expressions. range from 4,000 some odd nanoseconds to maybe 100,000 nanoseconds. So we're not even talking microseconds. We're not talking seconds. But again, if you're processing terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data, you've got to be aware of that. It does add up. Math. We don't want to use regular expressions typically where math is called for. If you try and math, in my example here, I say, you're trying to match a range containing n contiguous numbers. That's hard, almost impossible to express in regular expression. It's easy to express for a You can say, if you see a number, and the next number is 1 plus the last number, and the next number is 1 plus the last number, that's easy to say programmatically. It's hard to say in a regular expression. You can't really say, is this current regular expression one greater than the prior number, unless you start making character classes that are just enormous. So math is not a place you want to use regular expression. Generic XML parsing. This is the stuff of flame wars. Um, regular expressions cannot truly parse XML perfectly. But nobody uses XML truly generic way. Everyone uses a subset of XML. It's only really meaningful if you know what, what's in your XML, what the contents are. If there are parts of the XML that you want to recognize and react to, that's the only time XML can truly be meaningful. You can't, you can't truly do anything worthwhile with XML if you're trying to approach it from the standpoint of, I know nothing about my input and I have to learn it all on the fly. That doesn't work so well. So, in the general case, XML parsing is supposedly no no. But in the specific case, where you know what the XML is going to look like, typically because you or someone sitting next to you wrote it, or someone nearby you wrote it, or you have lots of examples that show you exactly what it looks like, in those sorts of cases, regular expressions are just fine. Is that true for JSON and other things? Absolutely. Like true. Yes. For JSON or Gosh, there's so many serialization things. I can't even think of them all. 
IPv4 addresses and IPv6 addresses. I wasn't thinking that when I wrote this book. Here's an example of IPv4, of an IPv4 freedom expression. And this is what I call a cheater, right? This is a cheating of the expression because it will match all IPv4 addresses and illegal addresses, addresses that are not legal. So, you know, 300.300.300.300 is not a legal IPv4 address, but this will match. <coughs> so if you know you're only working with a list of regular expressions, a list of IP addresses that are legal, you don't have to care. But if you need to be able to tell the legal ones from the illegal ones, then you need a more complicated regular expression. And I've written one here that tries to be very exact. And it literally is this long. Right? So I'll just break down a little bit of it for you. 25 followed by 0 through 5. Or 2 followed by 0 through 4 or 0 through 9. Or a 0 or 5. And that's just for the first octet. Okay? So that gives you an idea of what you can do and when you might want to or when you might want to just say, I need a better way to do this. What else do we have? Alright, so this is kind of the end. I can talk about a couple more topics if you're interested. Or I can take some questions or we can call it a day. Who wants to hear about flavors for your expressions? Anybody? Alright, anybody have a question? Okay, well thank you very much. <laughs>
The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. CloudStack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that, uh, um, 
they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked.